Welcome to the end of artificial sounding hearing aids. Introducing WideX Moment, a hearing aid that processes sound so quickly that for the first time in a digital hearing aid, distortion caused by delay, the source of the unnatural sound often associated with hearing aids, is eliminated. So now, all you hear is a pure, natural, and engaging sound. A sound preferred by users in real-world tests. Leaving you free to experience every detail of those special moments that mean the most to you. Pure. Powerful. Discreet. Widex Moment. This sound changes everything. Welcome to this Widex Digital Broadcast, the very first of its kind. My name is Klaus Hövelt and I'm the Global Head of Education and Events and I will also be your host for the next couple of hours. I am super excited about the show today. Attending this digital broadcast from WideX, you will learn how to empower your clients through improved speech understanding and natural sound quality using the WideX Moment. We will show and explain with empirical studies how WideX Moment and in particular Pure Sound benefits both you, the hearing care professionals, and your clients, always turning the spotlight on the importance of individualization. We will look into the future and present an outlook on how our renowned artificial intelligence can contribute to support our ambition of intuitive integration into our clients' lives. I'm not the only one here today. I have my fantastic colleague, Oliver Townend, who is the lead audiologist for Widex. Welcome to the show. Hi, Klaus. Hi, everybody. So today we will have, of course, you and I, and we will have people in the studio, but we also would like to interact with the audience. How do, how do we do that? That's right. We're going to be interacting with you via questions that you can type in when you see the question interface pop up on your screen. We're also going to have a live fitting today here in the studio. And Klaus, I believe you're off to the fitting area right now. Absolutely. But first, we have a very special message from our CEO, Eric Bernard. Eric is dialing in from HQ as we speak, and he should be here. Hello, Eric. How are you? Can you Hi, Oliver. Me? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. And yes, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Hello. I'm Eric Bernard, CEO of WS Audiology. And I think um, we all know that we're living through uh, extraordinary times, challenging for some of us. And I really hope, sincerely, that you are doing well, that your loved ones are doing well, and also that your business is going well. As one of the world's leading hearing aid companies, we have very solid foundations and great teams all over the world. And whatever happens, we continue to innovate on the WADEX platform and as you know, yeah. mostly from Denmark. We're stable and financially very strong. And it's very important that you know that as you are partnering with us. We launched WADEX Moment in March when the first wave of COVID-19 started to roll over the world. We have pushed the launch through not only because we believe in this fantastic product, but also because we believe in our partnership with all of you. We never stopped innovating. You need great products. Your customers deserve the best possible, most natural sound. And I'm very proud about the positive reviews all over the world. We have seen many articles in the US, and European press that confirm the unique sound of Wadex moment. So natural that they do not sound like hearing aids at all. A US sound guru without a hearing loss even wrote in his review that to his own surprise, he prefers listening to music now through his Wadex moment hearing aids. I love it. I find this amazing. Again, 
I want to thank you. I want you to have a great day. I want to thank you for your trust, for partnering with us, and have a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much, Eric. And I'm now here in the remote fitting zone because here in these COVID-19 times, it is difficult to see your clinician face to face. So I've invited Eva uh, to tell us a little bit about what we can actually do. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you for having me. So um, obviously in this uh, period that we have right now, it is difficult to come out face to face and, and speak with your clinician. What can Widex offer in, in, in that sense? Yeah, it's a good question. And today, uh, Widex have a really good tool that we can use for these kind of meetings uh, outside the clinic, and it's called the Widex Remote Care Solution. Mm. So it's basically just, I have my computer with the Compass GPS, the software here, and my client is set up with his uh, phone mm -hmm. uh, with an app called Widex Remote Care app, very easy, and a remote link. All right. So it's super easy to use. And we do have a very, very special guest at the other end in our remote session. It is a uh, great hi. honor and a big pleasure to introduce Steve Lukather from the guitars from Toto. Welcome to the show, Steve. Hi, guys. How's it going? Pretty good. Thank you so much. And a couple of weeks back, um, we actually sent a video crew to, uh, to your house just to talk about your hearing loss and your experience with Widex. Yes, sir. Hey, this is Steve Lukather, uh, guitar player in Toto, and also Ringo Starr and his all-star band. As a lifetime musician, obviously, I've endured the perils of loud sounds. I put myself in harm's way. I was an idiot. Back in the 70s when I first started, it was like click track, louder, louder, and be like, that's rock and roll. You know, it's supposed to be loud. My hearing is like probably, you know, besides my hands, are the most important things I got on my body for my career. You know, I don't care if you mess this up. Nobody bought a record because I'm a pretty boy. <laughs> I was on a stage with uh, Carlos Santana and Jeff Beck. This was the one time that I got the ring that never went away. It was that one punch that takes a boxer from being, hey, how's it going? So I haven't heard silence since 1986. I have found myself saying what all the time. How many times you go, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and going like I couldn't hear a word they said. What? I did that for a lot of years until I ran into my friend Brad Whitford from Aerosmith and he was talking to me. I kept going, what? He goes, bro, you need one of these, man. And he whipped out the, you know, his little device and I didn't even know he was wearing it. We try and crack up and go, yeah, we knew this day would come. We had hoped by the time we needed one that it would be like this, that you wouldn't need to be wearing two like tires on the side of your head. Can't see I'm wearing it, can you? See, even if I'd move my hair, you can't see it. They're not your daddy's or your grandpa's hearing aids, man. No, 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 no. The Widex moment hearing aid has changed my life, honest to God. There's no shame in admitting that as you get older, you get a little weaker. Even if you're not a musician, it happens. When I went down and I had them put in, I almost had tears in my eyes because I haven't been able to hear that frequency for a long time. Quality's incredible. You have an app on your phone. You can change the EQ and the volume and the left and right depending on who you are and what your needs may be. And I realized that I could trust these. I mix my new record wearing these things. It's coming out fab. These things are great. You'll probably have to cut that out, but get one. Thank you, Steve. That was a great video uh, from, from your house. I was wondering, yeah, um, what does sound mean to you? Well, I'm a musician. I mean, no, no, if I can't hear anything, it's really hard to make music or compose. I mean, uh, um, it's been my whole life. Without my hands and my ears, I'm pretty much worthless. You know, I mean, you can punch me anywhere else, but just watch out for the, <laughs> don't kick me in the ears and... I got scared. I mean, I was a studio musician for like 25 years, which means the headphones were on like 14 hours a day, which with in the old days with the click tracks and a lot of guys playing at the same time, it got real loud and your ears just closed down. You don't realize it when you're you know, 19, 20, 25 years old. You know, you think you're bulletproof. You think you can take anything. I remember my mother, we used to rehearse at the house, you know, like a full volume, like as if with no audience, like we really needed to play that loud. It was a more of a rebellious thing, really. And uh, my mother also said, you're, you're going to regret this when you get older. You're going to be deaf. You're, gonna, you're really going to hurt. 
And, you know, I said, we all went, hey, 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 rock and roll was young and new, and uh, we thought we knew everything, just like all kids do. Hmm. And here I am at 63 years old, and I, bef- I fought it for the last probably 10 years. I probably should have done this 10 years ago, because, it, but there wasn't a sophisticated device like WideX like there is now, you know what I mean? I know that you're using the Moment app uh, on your phone. What do you think about the app? I'm just getting to learn how to use it. I honestly God just got it. So uh, I'm trying to get the little feedbacks out that sometimes come in different, you know, depending how close people get to you. I happen to be in love, so my, my girlfriend and I smooch a lot, and sometimes it feeds back. So, Steve, okay, I, I also would like to know if you have used the app and made some programs um, on your own with the app. I'm, I'm about to get into that because I just got it and I'm just, I, now that I have it on my phone, that's the thing, this, this is so, um, it's like space age, really. Who knew that they could have stuff like this, you know, wireless on the phone and, the, and it doesn't look weird and it's, and it's, you get used to the fidelity, like the old ones used to sound like you were inside of a plastic garage. These once once you get used to it, it's it, you forget you're wearing them, and it's really helpful. I mixed an album wearing them with, with a very trusted set of ears next to me, the guy, the engineer who really protects his ears. And I said, "Am I hearing what you're hearing? Please tell me, so I can adjust." You know, I I had to get used to going from all the old way to the new way, and now all the frequencies that we're missing that I used to go, I'm not hearing enough 18 because there's plenty, dude. You know, I can now balance that out. And even change the EQs to three different things that I just touch my ears and it goes bum bum. There's three different kinds of EQ depending on where you are in the room and all that stuff. Uh, I'm just getting used to the possibilities of this thing. I think it's a, uh, and you guys keep adding new cool things to it all the time. So it's a constant uh, upgrade. That that sounds fantastic, uh, Steve. And we'll get back to that a little bit later in the show. So, but Eva, what 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 are we planning on doing today with uh, with Steve? So we are going to do a little fine tuning with the hearing aids, and we are also going to talk about sound sense learn, the artificial intelligence possibility that's in the app, the A/B comparison. Yeah. We're going to get to that, and talk a little bit about listening programs and what that they can do for uh, Steve. All right, thank yeah. you. fantastic, Steve. Are you ready for this? I'm. Yeah, I think so. Maybe I should put my <laughs> pants back on. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll leave you guys to it. Have fun. Um, we will come back uh, a little later today with Eva and Steve uh, in the show. Now we will open up for the questions so we will have your participant uh, engagement and interaction with us. So you can type in questions in the box below and we will see if we can uh, answer the questions as we go along in the show. Now we need to go over to Oliver in the lounge area. Uh, I know, Oliver, you have some very interesting guests uh, to talk about the development of pure sound and also the sound quality it delivers. Thanks, Klaus. And for our next segment, I'm joined here in the lounge area by two esteemed colleagues, Adam Vesterman, Innovation Manager, and Laura winter Barling, Research and Evidence Specialist, who are here to talk to us about pure sound. Now, pure sound, is a great feature, mm. but it didn't just come uh, from nowhere. So what problem were you trying to solve with pure sound, Adam? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that question, Oliver. So the main question we were trying to solve is what's known as the comb filter effect. Okay. So the comb filter effect is, is something that affects quality quite uh, negatively for a mild to moderately hearing impaired with an open fitting. So let me try to explain what the comb filter is. So when we have sound coming from the outside, some of it reaches the hearing aid first, as you can see in the graphic here, and is processed with some sort of delay. At the same time, you have sound reaching the ear through the mold and mixing with the sound processed through the hearing aid. So when you have two sound waves and they have different delays and thereby also different phases, and you add them up, what you get is peaks and troughs in the sound wave. This is known as the comb filter effect. And, and how does this sound? Well, it's the sound of a, a tube or like a tin-like effect. And it's really uh, what we at least believe is one of the major depr- uh, deficits to, to sound quality for uh, mild to moderate hearing, hearing aids. So pure sound is, is really the, the ultimate sound quality, we believe, for the mild to moderately hearing impaired. So designing something to overcome yes. this, this barrier yeah. in, in sound quality uh, and making it e- easier for people just to accept, accept the sound uh, yeah. and get used to the hearing aids. I mean, did this come out of, of nowhere or, or have you built on other Widex features? 
Yeah, so uh, many years ago now, we sat together in an innovation team and really looked at what are the major detriments of wearing a hearing aid? What happens physically? What happens acoustically when we put on a hearing aid? And as soon as we dove into the, the open fits, we found sort of the, the comb filter effect staring at us. And we had to sort of find a way to overcome the, the comb filter effect. And, and one of the key points to attack is the delay and the forward delay in the hearing aid. So we needed to make a hearing aid with virtually no delay. Mm. So this was sort of the, the innovation challenge. So we worked on this for quite some years. It took us quite some time to get to a point where we sort of had the first hearing aid running with sort of something like, like pure sound. Mm. Um, it, was, it was a bit of an uh, epiphany moment, uh, trying the hearing aid for the first time, rock, walking around the office. We were super excited. Uh, it's, it sounded really great. So you asked about the Widex heritage leading up to pure sound. Yep, yep. There's a couple of aspects I think are super important when it comes to realizing pure sound and the way we've done it. One of them is the way we've done the input converters in the Widex hearing aid and our sort of industry leading sample rate. Okay. It's a little bit technical or a bit nerdy, but, <laughs> but there, there's some filtering you have to do in the beginning when you do it this way that will cause some delay. And it's really only with the way we approached input converters that you could make pure sound. Mm. So uh, we we're sort of uh, happy to have this legacy to build on. Furthermore, the Widex platform has sort of always had a, a tendency to prioritize sound quality, to give a natural sound. And when we make pure sound and we take the, the gains from the compressor or the noise reduction and the way we treat and touch the sound and we mimic it in pure sound, we're building on the Widex legacy here. So all the things that make a, a normal Widex hearing aid sound good also make the pure sound hearing aid sound great. Wow. So, so what you're saying is that if Widex hadn't paid attention to details for the past 20 years or so, we wouldn't be where we are today with pure sound? No, we would be in a different place. We mm. would have much more of an uphill battle. Mm. Uh, and I don't know if we would have even made it. OK, mm. thanks. Right, because the sound was so clean in the first place to get it even, even cleaner. Mm. Um, it, was a, it was a challenge, but it, Widex was in the right place to, to mm, meet that challenge. Yeah. If you had to describe pure sound in, in one sentence, um, what would you say? Yeah, I think it's the ultimate uh, sound quality in a hearing aid for the mild to moderately hearing impaired. Okay, well, it's clearly <laughs> a great sound, and you had your epiphany moment when you wore it for the mm. first time, and I certainly thought it was amazing when I heard it for the first time, but we are inside the industry somewhat and, and um, to help us understand if this could be heard by real people um, I'm joined here now by, by Laura who's going to talk to us about some of the studies we did to see what the effect was of pure sound. Yeah so our starting point were some uh, measurements of delay okay. uh, that we'll see here um, we've got on the left uh, a plot of the frequency uh, on the x-axis and then the the delay on the on the y-axis. And we've done some measurements both for our own hearing aids and for some of the other hearing aids in the industry. And we've plotted some of the competition in yellow and red and green. We then have uh, the wide extended delay in purple. And you can see it's already significantly lower than, than the rest. But pure sound that we show in blue is really in a league of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, the delay. We then see the effect of the delay on the right, uh, where we see the gain and frequency for these different hearing aids. And we see exactly those curves that Adam was, was talking about, these uh, comb filter shapes for um, the competition, whereas pure sound just shows this nice smooth curve in blue. Mm. So that was our starting point. But of course, technical measurements isn't enough, right? We want to know what it sounds like to real people. So right. we had two groups of of uh, uh, participants in this study. Uh, one group, and I think that's the most important, were the people with hearing loss, yeah. mild to moderate hearing loss, some people with hearing aid experience, some without hearing aid experience. And that's our target group for pure sound. So we really want to know what it sounds like for them. But we also included a group of normal hearing listeners because we wanted to also look at what is the effect of delay on how sound compares to unamplified sound. Mm. So what does it sound like to normal hearing people? Okay, but this wasn't a, a study done in the lab. No, exactly. We, we had to navigate this, this slightly tricky uh, continuum in the, in the hearing aid industry okay. that you can either go to the lab and do something really nicely controlled. You know what the input is, you know all the acoustical parameters, uh, and that works nicely for some things. 
Uh, and then you can also go into real life and just let people rate uh, their sound in a lot of different situations. Uh, we do that with something called ecological momentary ass assessments, mm -hmm. and that's a, also a very nice tool for some situations. But for this particular study, we wanted some, something in between. So we went for a guided work methodology where uh, the researcher, in this case me, uh, takes people out into different situations in the real world. So we are out of the lab, but we go to the same kind of acoustic environments. We ask people to do the same things uh, so that everybody has similar experiences. It's not perfect. Sometimes it's raining and it sounds different. Sometimes there's a truck backing and it sounds different. But it, overall, it's, it's, it's quite similar. Um, and it also has the nice side effect that you don't just get a preference rating, for instance. You can also ask people, so why do you prefer this particular uh, sound? OK, cool. So what were the findings in this? Do you have any graphs to show? Yeah, I've brought along three graphs. Uh, the first one you see here yeah. is a really uh, simple comparison. We are looking at all the situations in which people uh, performed a rating. So they simply listened to two programs, program mm. one and program two, and said which one they preferred. And we see here for the group with hearing loss that uh, almost three times uh, as many times they preferred pure sound uh, compared to standard delay. Um, for the group with normal hearing, it's an even stronger difference. Uh, so overall, binary rating, it, it looks very strong for pure mm. sound. The second graph we see here is a little bit more complicated because we're looking at not just the binary preference between pure sound and standard delay, but at how much people prefer it. Mm. Uh, so I asked whenever people had a preference, I said, well, do you think the program you prefer is a lot better than the other one? Is it better than the other one or is it a little better than mm. the other one? And that scale can then be translated into numbers going from minus three, meaning that standard delay is much better, to plus three, that pure sound is much better. And what we see in this graph is that for uh, each and every single type of situation, we actually have a pure sound preference. Mm. So the mean degree of preference is always for pure sound. Um, it varies a little bit. It's stronger in some situations than in others, uh, but it's there for the, for the whole range of situations. Mm. And that's really important because we don't want to send people out into the real world with hearing aids that sound great in three types of situations and terrible in three yeah, others. Of course not. So it's, it's, it's an important result, this yeah. one, that it, that it holds across the, across the board. Mm. And then the final graph is another fairly simple one because we uh, also, at the end of this guided walk experience, ask people, if you could only have one hearing aid program, which one would it be? Mm. And here really we see an overwhelming majority saying pure sound. So you see the hearing loss group on the left, and here we've got 85% who prefer pure sound. Yeah. And you see the normal hearing group on the right, uh, and here we've got 100% who prefer pure mm -hmm. sound. Um, and I think it's interesting with the group with hearing loss that we're actually looking at a group who are used to delay, because not everyone, but um, more than half of them are already hearing aid users. Mm. And all hearing aids in the industry have this delay. So they're used to listening to the delay, and they still prefer pure sound. And for the normal hearing group, it's also um, really um, a strong result because it shows that, that this pure sound is a lot more similar to unamplified sound than standard delay would be. Mm. OK, thank you. Cool. Those are really impressive results. Um, oh. Perhaps I uh, believe you got yeah, some Yeah, I heard that as well. In. So, um, yes, I can see. And the first question that we have is actually about this guided walk uh, study, Laura. It is um, in this study, the guided walk, uh, what were the people's reasons for preferring, preferring the Pure Sound program? That's a, a good question. And it's also something that's really nice about the guided walk that we can get those kinds of reactions. Uh, the most frequently occurring things that people said were that it's more natural mm -hmm. and that it's less noisy. And I think the less noisy really refers to the absence of this comb filtering because that sounds like noise. Um, so those are, are the majority uh, that say that. But there are also a number of other reasons. So uh, some say that pure sounds sound clearer. Mm. Uh, some say that it sounds warmer, some say that it sounds more pleasant. There, there are all sorts of words that apply okay. to it, but yeah. it's really naturalness and less noise that, that stand out. Okay, thank you. I hope that was a good answer for, for the person who asked. Uh, the next question that I have here is, uh, what are your thoughts about the future of pure sound? And I guess that's for you, Adam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really an exciting future. Um, I think we've opened up a new field and a new approach to processing sound in hearing aids. 
I think we're really onto something. That's what we see from uh, Laura's studies yeah. as well. And now we just have to sort of go down the path. So there are many features that we haven't uh, touched upon. Everything needs to be adapted. Everything needs to be thought out mm. in, in that way with a pure sound approach. So one of the things is, is feedback cancellation and how to handle different gains. Mm. Another thing is the beamformer, where we have a, a we we have a simple omnidirectional beamformer on pure sound, and we want to uh, expand on this in the future. Mm. So I think we have a, a, a long pipeline uh, coming and a super exciting pipeline uh, with sort of. Uh, an offset in the pure sound that we've, yeah. we've launched here. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the last question that I will take there, so unless, of course, you have more questions as well, uh, Oliver, but I think one of them that I would take here is, let me take, uh, let me take this one here. The, the evidence uh, on pure sound is very interesting, Laura. Um, can you elaborate a bit on which future studies you would like to see the most? so many different studies to be honest but one thing that i think would be really interesting was to look not just at the standard delay in widex devices but also at uh, longer delays in the industry uh, there's a little bit of a challenge there because we can't make that comparison blind because we simply can't make the the delay in the widex devices much longer mm. than it is and as we saw that's in the low end mm. but uh, i think it's something that could be interesting to work with looking at well what what's the effect of different d steps of delay really yeah, yeah. on on sound quality okay so that's one thing um, another thing is really also looking at not just the sound quality but also at speech understanding with pure sound it's important that the sound quality doesn't come at the cost of reduced speech intelligibility. And as Adam was saying, we have an omnidirectional microphone, so we want to look at, well, what's the effect uh, of that on speech intelligibility? Mm, okay, all right. Don't know if you have any other yeah, questions, yeah? I, I really just wanted to, to hear from Adam because this is your, your baby. Mm. I mean, when, when, you, when you heard it for the first time, it, it, mm. it, it took you back. Did you know it was going to be as successful as it is? Um, no, <laughs> it's the easy answer. But I think it's, it's one of those epitome moments. Mm. And the beauty is really in the simplicity of it. Right. Because it is just a, hearing it with an extremely low delay. Uh, we were sitting at the desks in, in, in the office and you can imagine a, a simulator, a lot of print cards, <laughs> a lot of the uh, wires coming out everywhere and putting it on and then hitting the keyboard for the first time. And you know, as developers, we wear hearing aids a lot because we like to listen to our algorithms. And we're used to, you know, a keyboard has this very hollow, tube-like thing, clickety-clack sound. All of a sudden, it was like, it's right there. It was so sharp. Mm. And that was, that was sort of, OK, we're on to something here. But from there, and this is, this is some years ago, getting it to a full product, it, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a long ride. Wow. And you must be so proud of it. Oh, I'm at least excited. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited to see what's going to happen, at least. Thank you, Adam, for that uh, answer. And thank you so much for all the questions that you have typed in in the boxes. Please keep them coming so that we can engage with you as we go along in the show. Uh, thank you so much for those that we have so far. Thanks, Klaus. And thank you, Adam and Laura. It was a pleasure having you with us in the studio today. And to touch on some of those research gaps that Laura pointed to, we're now joined by Francis Cook, our research guru from Chicago, who's going to talk to us about the investigations that he completed looking into the speech understanding with pure sound in a novel way, using some really interesting techniques to uncover what is it about pure sound that makes it sound so good, but also makes it so easy to understand what you're hearing. Thank you, Oliver, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this broadcast. Uh, it is indeed my honor uh, to be able to share the experience that we have uh, with our customers. I think during your interview with Laura and Adam, uh, he mentioned two things. You know, one is the fact that this low delay feature uh, has this wonderful, uh, sh very short delay, uh, and that could potentially help speech understanding. And the other question that you raised that we were thinking about is the fact that it doesn't have the directional microphone. So we ask two questions in our study. Uh, the first one is, well, does the low delay feature uh, in our hearing aid 
Can, can it improve speech understanding? And the second question we ask is, well, because of the lack of a directional microphone, could that compromise speech understanding in typical noisy situations? So in our study, uh, we try a very different way of looking at this speech uh, understanding issue. Uh, we actually used EEG study or electroencephalographic uh, uh, measurements. And, and the reason why we did that is because when you are doing speech kind of testing, behavioral testings, there are actually many factors that could affect the result. And at the end, you really would not know, does the feature improve speech understanding? Or if it did not, well, why did it not? So if we do EEG type study, then we would be able to know what may be the factors, what are the cues that could have affected speech understanding. I also mentioned a little bit about speech cues, getting to the fundamental aspect of what helped speech understanding. Indeed, if we look back a little bit, take a step back, and try to understand how we understand speech, we usually do a process which we call auditory scene analysis. So what that means is that a listener, when he gets to a noisy place with many people, he will take the speech sounds, it all goes up to the brain, and what he or she will do is to listen to these sounds, extract the features from these sounds, and kind of group all these features together, you know, so that uh, if a particular uh, sound has, has uh, like this kind of fundamental frequency, this kind of onset, this kind of pitch, then this would likely be coming from the same person, from the same talker. So this way, doing this scene analysis, the person will be able to know, well, out from these many people talking, I am focusing in on you. The voices, the sounds that I hear coming from you have this characteristic, this fundamental frequency, this pitch, this kind of onset. And one of the cues that we talked about that have been proven to support speech understanding in noise, especially in this kind of situation, is the fundamental frequency of the F sub zero uh, cue. And what this cue is, is very simple because we all talk with a particular fundamental frequency, some lower, some higher. So this is one cue that we have. Uh, and this cue we know from the scene analysis is highly correlated with the person's ability to distinguish one talker from another talker in a background of noise. And this cue has been proven to highly correlate with speech understanding in noise. The response that we measured, the EEG response that we measured, is called frequency following response, uh, FFR in short. And more specifically, we were looking at the envelope following response. So you say, wow, all these terms here, what, what exactly does it mean? Well, the FFR, the EFR response, is a surface uh, recorded non-invasive method that allows us to measure the brain activities when a sound actually goes into the brain. Okay, so if you look at this particular figure, we see a sound coming from the, uh, uh, from the left side, or my left side here, uh, and you can see this sound going to the, to the, to the ear, go up the brain, uh, and it gets processed. It mixed with the sounds from the other ear, it gets influences from the cortex, from the brain down to modify the goodness of this sound. So what, when we do EEG, when we do FFR type response, we put an electrode on the person's vertex. Uh, we put one on the forehead and one behind the ear. We present the sound many, many times, and then we average the response. We average the brain wave that is picked up by the electrodes on the head. And you can actually see some similarities between what we recorded versus what we put in. Okay, if you see that, you can see the da sound, you know, with all the harmonics and stuff, and you can actually see something similar to that on the right-hand side. So what we did in this particular study is we measured the EEG uh, response, okay? We take this response and we separate out the envelope from what we call the temporal fine structure. Because this response looks so much like the stimulus that we put in, that's why we called it the frequency following response. 
And because we look at the envelope of the response, we call that the envelope following response, or EFR, uh, in this particular study. So this figure, what I'm sharing with you here, is the stimulus, is the envelope of the DA uh, uh, syllable without the DA sound at the beginning. So it's basically the harmonics of this particular sound. Okay? And you will see some interesting things. So if you look at this figure here, you see four little peaks. Okay, that's the harmonics uh, that is in the da syllable. And an important point to note is that those peaks are actually separated by about 10 milliseconds. So that, of course, reflects the fundamental frequency of 100 hertz uh, of the particular speaker. So important to note where the peaks are uh, in this uh, particular response. Now, what I'd like to share with you now is the result of the first uh, manufacturer, manufacturer number one. We can make at least two observations. One is that with this green uh, 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 response, we saw the first two peaks only. You know, we see a peak at two, 20 milliseconds, we see a peak at 30 milliseconds. We don't see the peaks from other uh, areas. So the third and the fourth peaks are pretty much gone. And the amplitude, of course, in the other uh, peaks there are much smaller uh, than the first one. Now, if we further look at the second manufacturer, okay, the one with the purple line, the one with the six millisecond delay, we see similar patterns. But in the third and the fourth peaks, we do see a little bit better of the envelope. Now, even though you see a little peak, the peak is also not at the same peak not at the same phase locking at the stimulus that we see. So if you pay attention to the third one, uh, the peak is moved a little bit earlier, as well as the fourth peak is also moved a little earlier than the peak that we saw in the original signal. I'm sure you'll be asking, so what does the pure sound movement look like? Well, wait no more. Here's what we see. So now what we have here is the response, is the neural response, the EFR response of the pure sound program superimposed on the other two neural response. And you will see two things that is rather obvious. One is that the blue waves, the, 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 the pure sound that we see, has four very well-defined peaks, you know, and they synchronize, they phase lock to the signal very well. At 20, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds, they don't just with, appear with the first two, they appear with all four of them. That's what we call synchrony, better synchrony, or better face locking. The second thing that you see is that the peaks of those things are much higher, much more robust, much more even than what we see in the other two manufacturers. Okay? So, that is also a very distinct uh, feature there. So what does it mean? What are the implications of this? Here are two things that we know. One is that this fundamental frequency Q, this F sub zero Q, is a very important Q that is well established in the field of auditory scene analysis to be an important Q for the perception of pitch, uh, for the perception or, or identification of a particular person, especially in a noisy background. So that is one thing. And the second thing we know about this particular uh, EFR response is that it correlates very well with speech and noise ability. So people who have a good EFR tend to have better speech understanding in noise ability. And uh, and there's also a lot of studies showing that people who have been trained you know, to listen to sounds, uh, like musicians, uh, like people who have gone through rehabilitation, uh, they do tend to have a better, more synchronized uh, EFR response. So what it means you know, in this particular case, you know, with a better synchronized response, is we can predict, because of this better synchrony, the person may have a better sound clarity. You know, they might find the quality of sounds better. You know, that, of course, Laura has demonstrated uh, in her study. 
And we can also predict that people with this type, uh, with, with a better EFR, would probably have better speech and noise ability. So, so we would predict better performance with the Pure Sound program uh, than the other uh, manufacturer program because of the better clarity, the better speech and noise, and perhaps improved listening effort. Things are not quite as tiring to listen to when you have a more synchronized uh, neural response. Okay? And this, of course, could be very important. Why? Because with this improved performance, the person is likely to accept the hearing aid sooner. So one question that some of you may ask is, well, you don't have a directional microphone uh, in the pure sound. How do you justify that? You know, is it of consequence? Well, and that is true. That's a very good question. But if we think about it, you know, from two lines of evidence, then we may think that this may not be as, as, as critical. One is we know that the benefit of a directional microphone decreases as the vent opening increases. And of course, the target audience, the candidate for the pure sound program are people with mild to moderate hearing loss, people wearing an open type, open ear type fitting. The second very important question is the signal to noise ratio where we can see a directional microphone benefit. We see that the benefit typically occurs in poorer signal to noise ratio, like a zero, minus five, those kind of signal to noise ratio situations. In real life, people are likely to spend in situations where the signal to noise ratios are between five to 15 dB, okay? Far above the signal to noise ratios that a directional microphone could benefit. So that is why in the second study that we did, you know, we purposely look at and compare the performance, the speech and noise performance uh, of the listeners with the pure sound with our competitors that have the directional microphone and see if indeed it makes any difference. And what we did is we used the quick RRT or the quick repeat and recall test uh, that we developed at our lab just to see how people perform on that particular test. And of course, we purposely put the speech in the front and the noise directly from the back, just so that we can let the directional microphones on our competitor's product actually operate in, the, in, in this natural way. So what we have here is the performance on the y-axis versus the signal to noise ratios that we tested the patients at. And the different shade here is the normative performance, what normal hearing people would do uh, on this particular test. So if you have a data point in the green area, that means someone performs better than 95%. And if you are in the yellow area, that's you know, in the bottom uh, 5%, meaning that you really have a problem. So two things that you can see. One, all three hearing aids perform similarly. Okay, they are almost on top of each other. That demonstrated to us that even though we do not have the directional microphone in the pure sound program, it works as effectively as our competitors' hearing aids. Okay, and that's important to note. And by the way, they all have adaptive directional microphone and fancy noise reductions and, and everything else. The second, perhaps also very important thing to note is that all three hearing aids put the patient's performance in the blue area there. And that to me is more important because that is the bottom range, the lower range of what normal hearing people could do on this particular test, okay? So we are very pleased to say that with this, um, with the pure sound program, they per it performs as effective as our competitors' hearing aids. But what if someone goes in a really, really noisy situation, even though that's not typical, even though that's not realistic, we have this feature which allows the user to simply switch from the pure sound program into the universal program or the master program where you can specify whichever microphone mode you want. So in summary, what we have done in these two studies uh, to demonstrate two things, two very simple things. You know, one is through the use of EEG measurement, 
we are able to identify a particular Q, you know, the F sub zero Q, you know, which is an important uh, Q for, for speech understanding in noise, and we can, we, we, we can show that it does improve that. It does provide the brain with a better neural input that goes up to the brain for processing. So, so you, you can kind of look at that, you know, as like fresh food, you know, versus processed food, okay? So in fresh food, we see that, you know, you don't add anything, things are natural, okay? Uh, so that the person's digestive system can digest and assimilate easily. You know, the same, I think, can, can be observed uh, with the low delay technology, with the EEG response that we measure. You know, in essence, we are giving the brain a healthier neural input, you know, so the brain can have an easier time to process and to easier uh, to, to understand. The second thing that we were able to show here is that despite the lack of a directional microphone, you know, under realistic signal to noise ratio conditions, person can use the low delay program, the, the, the pure sound program, enjoy good sound quality with minimal effort and not affect the speech understanding uh, in those noisy situations. So I see a potential with low delay technology starting another revolution, another advancement uh, in our field. Uh, and the studies that we can do is, is plentiful. And, and that's all I have. And thank you so very much, Oliver. Uh, it has been lovely for me to, to share our experience with you. Thank you. Wow, that was really amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Francis. Yeah, thanks, Francis. It's really cool to see what Pure Sound can do. Absolutely. So, when you tried Pure Sound for the first time, what were what were your thoughts? Yeah, when I, I put it in for the very first time, uh, it, it really blew me away. Mm. Um, it, it certainly got my mind thinking. We're so used to hearing hearing aids with this process sound, with this signature, the the comb filter that you can hear. So you knew you were wearing a hearing aid. And all of a sudden, you put a, a hearing aid on, and this acoustic landmark had, had gone. Mm. Uh, and so you were asking questions, is it, is it really on? Has it just turned down the, the gain, the yeah, amplification? Yeah. Um, what's happening? And then when I, I spent time with, with Adam and the guys developing the feature, I understood that it was, it was much more than this, right? That what they were trying to overcome was one of the last great barriers to sound quality within hearing aids and the work that they had to put in to significantly reducing uh, the delay in the hearing aids um, was, was incredible. But the, the problem was so big mm. and the challenge was large in order to, to solve it. But by solving this solution, it makes everything so much more simple mm. and it I think it's a good analogy to think sometimes the simplest solutions are the best. Yeah, sort of and, what Adam was actually alluding right, to but before. But we're not yeah. we're not adding on feature on top yeah. of feature on top of feature. We're going back to the root cause and cleaning up the signal yeah. once and for all. So, so why is it that pure sound is so good with speech understanding? I think uh, Francis uses the analogy. Mm. Um, he compares the natural foods. Mm. organic foods with, with processed artificial foods. Yeah. And that the natural food is, is better for you, your body can assimilate it better. And, and I think we should think about it in this way. Um, his EEG data is interesting, and I think mm. we should come on to that uh, a bit later. But when we looked at the speech and noise, we should really look at what we were comparing. We were comparing a hearing aid with very processed signal, mm. with a directional microphone, and uh, additional gain. And then we, on the other hand, we had the pure sound with a very pure unprocessed signal yeah. and omnidirectional microphone and less gain. And the result was very similar, that the speech in noise score was pretty much the same for both mm. systems. So you could think that actually you need the directional microphone and the additional gain to overcome the poor signal quality mm. in the processed hearing aid. 
And if you don't have a poor signal quality, yeah. i.e. you have a very good, clean signal, then, well, you no longer need the directional microphone or the extra gain. The brain can sort out the signal yeah, yeah. itself yeah. because it recognizes that. Yeah. So you also mentioned the EEG data. Uh, is there anything in this data that sort of back this up? Yeah, the, the, this recognizing mm. of, of the signal is really clear in the EEG data. Mm. So um, Francis talks about the fundamental frequency uh, of speech. That mm. means the fundamental frequency of your voice yeah. and my voice is going to be subtly different. You could think about it really as the pitch of different people's voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it also is uh, about the, the overall tone and the characteristic of, of your voice yeah. compared to my voice. And when we have this fundamental frequency, it makes it very easy for your brain, your, your hearing, to separate speakers, to separate speech from noise. Um, and this is how your brain works. This is how you, as a, a normal hearing person, can stand in a crowded room and start to sort of tune into one voice and tune out of others. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we sort this out. But if you start to listen through a hearing aid, and the EEG, EEG data was showing that with a, a, a processed amplification, this F sub zero fundamental frequency mm -hmm. in the EEG response is, is distorted, it disappears, it's not as robust mm -hmm. as the original signal. Mm -hmm. So you, you, your brain can't do what it wants to do naturally. Okay. With pure sound, we get this incredibly robust phase-locked signal, which is more representative of the original speech when measured in the brain. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're feeding the brain the natural food yeah, yeah, that yeah. it wants. And, and in that sense, it, it works better with what we're giving it and can perform in a system that has no assistance from a directional microphone yeah, or, yeah. or additional gain. And, and that's really exciting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and when we talk about pure sound, we talk a lot about speech. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking also, now that we have Steve here as a musician, is there anything for musicians with pure sound? Yeah, I, I, and I think this, I can speak to this for, in two ways. Mm -hmm. um, Francis talks about the, uh, the, the musician's brain that they're somewhat attuned mm. to sound. Uh, he, also, he says that the, the musician has a better replication of the uh, fundamental frequency when measured with EEG. But I've also spent time with musicians mm. listening to what they think about the hearing aid, the moment hearing aid, when they listen in the universal program and when they listen in the pure sound program. Yeah. And we've actually spent time where they were playing their own instruments yeah. wearing the hearing aids. And, and what was really, really interesting and surprising um, was that they, they would describe the sound with the universal program as it's, it's good, it's mm. natural, and I can hear what I, I'm doing, but something is missing. Mm. Something's not quite there. I can't really describe it. Mm. And all of a sudden, when I switched the hearing aid over to pure sound, you saw a completely different posture when they were playing their instrument. And you could feel them somewhat becoming one wow. with, with the instrument yeah. they were playing. And they would describe to me about the, the, the pitch, the timbre, the, the intonation, everything that they expected to get mm. from their natural hearing, they were getting through the hearing aid when they were listening to, to pure sound. And I was blown away. Yeah. I mean, I can hear a difference but they could hear even more differences yeah. in this signal. And that, that's, that's, that's super exciting. Because they know sound better than, I guess, normal people, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, frequencies and all that, yeah. Th there are landmarks in the sound that yeah. they're used to hearing that I'm not. Yeah. But they can tell me that it's not there yeah. with universal and it's, wow. it's there with pure sound. Hmm. That's another level. Yeah, That's <laughs> really cool. Um, but I think, uh, just to wrap up, I think what is really important uh, to recognize here is we are just on the beginning of something. Mm. You know, Francis is really exciting about, excited about the, the future of more EEG studies. And, and Laura is also excited about the future of her research too. Yes. 
an atom is excited about where it can go with all of the extra developments and, yeah. and the, where we can apply this in the future. But I think we should just take a moment just to say, you know, thank you yeah. to all of the great colleagues we have at Widex Absolutely. who went into building such a fantastic hearing aid and bringing yeah. a great product to market. And, and this is truly the beginning of, of, of an of a amazing journey I agree. ahead of us. So, yeah. so thank you very much to them. Absolutely. And talking about sound quality, I'm joined by Florian Walters, a research colleague from Stockholm who's been investigating sound quality and asking for us, can we define sound quality? Hi, Florian. Hi, Oliver. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. I hope you're well. Um, thanks for dialing in. We're having a great show. Um, I just want to kick off with a, an opening question, quite a broad one. Can we define sound quality? And, and how important is sound quality to the hearing aid industry? I mean, there, there's some sort of self-evidence to, to that claim that, that sound quality in general um, is important to, to the industry and, and for hearing aids. And I mean, it's, it's the core concept of hearing aids to, to amplify sound. But despite that, it, it's sort of difficult to quantify it. I mean, there, there's some sort of a lack of consensus out, a consensus out there when it comes to definitions and conceptualization of uh, uh, sound quality as such. So how do we start to define sound quality? I mean, we could start looking at how the term was used and uh, is used by the industry and researchers around the globe. And uh, I think when we look a little bit around in, in the literature, we find that, that sound quality quite often is used as a synonym for, for different sound related aspects. You might be talking about naturalness, about broader bandwidth in terms of hearing aids, so with, with less distortion, sound not being too loud or sound right. being too loud. And I think that sort of shows the diversity of concepts that commonly are referred to as sound quality as such. So sound quality seldomly actually is the main research topic and then rather occurs as an outcome of, uh, of studies, for example, as an indicator for, for satisfaction. For example, there's uh, the study of uh, the series of studies, uh, of market track studies and Eurotrack studies, which, are, which is a well-known series of uh, hearing aid satisfaction studies. And, and they have been around for 20-something for years. And I think ever since, sound quality was in, identified as a main driver for hearing aid satisfaction, while the, least, the, or the factors least correlating with, uh, uh, with satisfaction were non-sound-related uh, aspects, such as battery life or uh, handling the hearing aid, uh, the, the volume control, or the visibility of the hearing aids. And I think that somehow shows the importance of, uh, of sound quality as such. And, and, and interestingly, there are many studies that actually correlate sound quality with satisfaction, but they are seldomly elaborating on, on causality. Um, meaning it's not always evident or the, the, the question is not always answered whether good sound quality leads to, to hear, higher hearing aid satisfaction or if, if people being more satisfied with the hearing aid for, for other reasons simply use the hearing aids more often in a longer time and, and just accept the sounds and, and have a better attitude towards sound. So. Another finding, an interesting finding that the market track studies uh, revealed is also that uh, newer hearing aids quite often lead to higher satisfaction in, in their studies. And, and that sort of reminded me of a, of a statement that I saw from, from the popular uh, YouTube uh, audiologist, Dr. Cliff, where he more or less states that sound quality or sound quality doesn't matter so much when you choose your new pair of hearing aids, since all the major brands that are out there actually have a, a quite good sound quality. So we're all in the same uh, ballpark when it comes to sound quality, maybe. But has anybody tried to define sound quality before? Have there been any previous attempts? There have been some. And uh, I specifically uh, want to mention two of them, which uh, might be of interest to our industry as well. And uh, one of them was, was done by, by Zakharov in 2018. And um, in his in his sort of definition, he mentions that the sound quality or the, the quality as such sort of is the suitability of a sound to a specific situation. Right. And while it sort of in the same direction goes the definition by, by Blauert and Jekos, which was done in 2012, where they say that the quality marks sort of the perceptual distance between sound character features and a set of reference features that the person has. 
and that the distance then is a measure of the degree to which the expectations of a person are fulfilled. And, and if you take those two definitions, you might see that it's actually quite difficult to see sound quality as, as one universal entity. And it's really important to consider context and, and look into those small in aspects of sound quality that add up to a concept in the end. So we actually started at looking at different aspects of sound quality and, and the relationships between these and the differentiating between what can be measured on the one hand and what is perceived on the other hand. Wow, that's really interesting. So you can characterize things uh, in sound between what can be measured and what can be perceived. Yeah, and there's actually a, a third part to that, but I, I can visualize that on, on the graph, which sort of summarizes the, the strain of thought. And uh, if you look at the visual and see uh, the leftmost column and uh, where we actually start off with, with the core of sound, with the acoustical characteristics that the sound has, which are objectively physically measurable. And, and there in the list, we see just a, a number of examples uh, that we count to that. And that's, for example, bandwidth, the frequency content, uh, compression uh, parameters that we have in the hearing aids, processing delay, distortion, roughness, sharpness, all the things that, that the sound has as such and that is measurable. But then uh, we, we put the people in place and uh, then suddenly there's the ear in the, in the chain. And then suddenly you're, you're perceiving those acoustical characteristics in a certain way. And uh, if you look at the middle column, you, you see some examples of uh, what percepts are out there and typically measured in, uh, in part of studies out there in, in research. And there we have things like loudness, clearness, brightness, and uh, other things like, like richness of the sound, comfort of the sound, roughness, sharpness there as well, because it's, it's both a percept but also an acoustical measurable uh, characteristic. But those two, there's a relation between them, and that's quite important that, that you define what you are talking about, actually, if it's, if it's uh, the characteristics or if it's the percept. And then the, the rightmost column is the very important column that often tends to be forgotten. And there's, there's a lot of context about, uh, about sound. As, as we heard in the definitions that I referred to earlier, there, there are things like the suitability of a sound to a situation, the, the appropriateness, if the sound is acceptable in a certain situation. And, and people have different expectations on how, how things should sound. And there's this perceptual difference, which Blau talked about, the difference to, to a reference that people have. So I think all the things together sort of give an idea about there's more than just the, the term sound quality. There's a whole concept that we have to keep in mind when we talk about that. So one mistake people are making is that they're maybe attributing sound quality to, to one thing alone. And we really should look at the, the total picture when we consider sound quality. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, if we actually as a company want to make use of, of this idea that we that I just showed in the, in the graph before, we, we actually have, have to consider three focus areas, which I show in, uh, in, in another picture. So you, if you look at, at this graph, uh, you see there are three main focus areas that we have to keep in mind if you want to, to talk and, and use, make use of sound quality in the, in the right way in the company. And the first one would be to, on the very left side, you see it would be the understanding of this relation, which I mentioned between the acoustical characteristics and the percepts. And then in the middle column, the very important aspect is to, to adjust our, our hearing aids and, and, and behaviors and so on to, to the environment and the context where, where sound plays a role. And then the rightmost column uh, is a very important aspect is to understand those individual references which people have when they make their, their sound quality assessments. That's uh, very interesting, Florian. Is, is this a, a new way of looking at sound quality? I mean, the focus areas as such haven't always been considered as, as such an interrelated construct as, as I've been showing maybe, but the, of course there has been research being done in, in each of those focus areas as such. That's nothing entirely new. But uh, if, if we look at them one by one, and uh, if, we, if we start off with the very, very left column of, of this graph and, and the term in terms of relation between acoustical characteristics and, and perception, we, we have to, to make sure that it's really important to state the purpose of research and the relations that we are doing, that we clearly communicate the acoustical characteristics and percepts that we are talking about that are on the test, and that we not equate everything with just this main concept of sound quality. Right. There, for example, there have been uh, uh, studies with normal hearing people from, from other domains where they have shown and where they have explored those uh, relationships between characteristics and, and percepts. And, and they have shown that, they're, that people, when they're making preference ratings on, on headphones, that they actually prefer those that had a very flat frequency response. 
and that they were were looking at sound and more natural sound and saying that was the reason why they preferred the one over the other. So there's there's relations relations made between characteristics and uh, and, and and perceptions. But uh, that's of course one group of uh, of test participants, and we in our in our domain we often talk uh, and have impaired people with impaired hearing in, in our tests. So it's not self-evident that the similar study with with hearing impaired people would would lead to similar outcome due to different needs and expectations that those those groups have. So, so that highlights the need to test with, with relevant target groups and with high degree of what we call elo, elo, ecological validity. So, and there has, has been a recent focus in the industry actually on on this by researchers around the world and even at us at uh, WS Audiology. So I would say it's there's still a long way to go until we actually fully understand to what extent relationships between acoustics uh, uh, and percepts studied in the lab actually apply in a similar way in the field in real life. And speaking of real life, that more or less brings us to the middle column of, of this graph, uh, where we need to consider environments and contexts and situations where sound matters. And if we think back about uh, the definition I gave by Zakharov, who was talking about the suitability of sound to specific situa situations, re research is actually stating that people are trained to identify natural sound sources, and, and they naturally attribute some sort of significance to them, which means that they make the right decisions in, in, and, give, and do the appropriate actions in certain situations, given on the sound that they recognize. So in other words, that means that unimpaired identification of sound sources helps us to navigate in everyday life and in everyday listening situations. And for example, things like distortion in, in, in the hearing aids and, and other artifacts could impair our ability to navigate. So in our field, the focus is often on matters, for example, such as speech intelligibility or speech recognition. And, and even though that's an essential aspect of oral communication, you should not forget that the, there's high importance of non-speech sounds and, and voice qualities that go beyond lexical contact uh, of, of speech. And that brings us to the rightmost column of, of, the, of, of the graph, where we see that they need to consider even the individual with their own set of references that they have when they make assessments of sound quality. So when we, when we think back to Blauert's definition, he mark, where quality marks the distance between features and the set of reference features that people have, then I have to say that it turns out that there's quite some research gap currently, that we are lacking detailed knowledge about those references individuals or maybe group of individuals that have when they're assessing sound quality. For exa examples could be that people with a unilateral hearing loss, they might take their, their normal hearing ear as a reference for, for making quality assessments. Or long-term hearing aid users might, might take the sound from previous hearing aids that they're used to as a reference. But people with quite mild, mild hearing loss, they could take hype equipment as, as their hearing aids or uh, as their headphones at home or, or their TV or favorite stereo as a reference. So that's really a, a, a research gap. Does this research gap set some direction for the future? Yeah, I think the research in the field of sound quality needs to become both more specific by meaning that we talk about those specific aspects of sound quality, but at the same time has to be a little bit more all embracing, meaning referring to the rightmost column of, of the figure that I showed that we actually have to weigh in context, expectations, references, and all those things to, to get a full picture of, of, of what we mean by quality of sound. And when we're trying to fill these research gaps, I think there, there are a couple of questions that could be, could be answers. And we want to know how well those finds that, we've, that we have in the lab, how they apply to the real, real world. We want to know which aspects of sound quality are, are those main drivers for preference or satisfaction. And we also try to, to identify and understand those individual references I, I talked about. Those are research gaps that we definitely need to fill. Right, so truly the, the individual is at the heart of the decisions about sound quality as well as the, 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 the hearing aid sound quality itself. And I, and I think that's really cool that reflects on the work we, we do at Widex. We, we do our utmost to provide the, the, the cleanest, most natural sound possible, uh, free of distortion to allow people to connect as, as best they can to not only speech understanding but the, the world around them as well. But then we don't really know what the individual wants. And this has a massive uh, factor to play on, on sound quality. So we need to provide them with the ability to personalize the sound themselves on top of the great natural sound that we start with. So even if we are able to define sound quality for hearing aids, what you're saying is that it might not be relevant for, for other domains of sound quality. 
Yes, I think the concept of sound quality or the quality of sound might differ for different applications and, and disciplines of, of science, but, but we still can have an impact on, on the quality of the provided sound by, by really thoroughly adjusting and choosing the acoustical characteristics of hearing aids, but keep in mind the variations and that come with individuals and all those countless different listening contexts and situations that's, that are out there in everyday life. So, so as long as we are unable to really commonly have this definition of sound quality, but which is applicable for, for, all, for all the situations, I think a, a valuable approach could be to actually provide sound as pure and natural as possible for each individual. Right. And, and that seems to be the, the wide X way, providing a, a sound that is, is so clean and, and undistorted that we tick as many sound quality boxes as possible but also allowing for personalization on top because who knows better than what they want than, than the individual wearing the hearing aid themselves. Thank you for joining us today, Florian. Thanks for having me. And to talk more about personalization, we're going to be joined in a moment by Jens, our AI expert. But before that, we're gonna pop over to join with Eva and Steve and see what they've been up to in the live fitting studio. And don't forget to keep sending your questions in to us here at the Widex studio. Thank you very much, Oliver. And over here we have a lot of fun. What have we been up to for the past 20 minutes? Oh, well, we have been discussing and exploring the sounds and learn, the artificial intelligence, and the, uh, the possibility that opens up for people that mm. are using hearing aids today. So it's very cool. I think you liked it, Steve. Yes, I do. I have it right here. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah, there it is. Can. Steve, I want to know, um, how, do you, how do you feel about this whole uh, remote consultations? Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Right. First off, it's fantastic, especially during these, you know, COVID times and all that stuff. Everybody's afraid of everybody. Uh, but for so many reasons, because I travel so much when I can travel, you know, I've been on the road for 45 years. I say if I have an issue, I could call the doctor or I could just myself go, wow, um, let me get in here and re-EQ this or something for the building I'm in, or sometimes they're big arenas, or sometimes it gets weird. I also take them, and this is interesting that you'll know, I, when I take these out when I perform and I put my inner monitors in, they're EQ'd exactly the same as the Widex in mm -hmm. the deficit in my hearing. So I have a completely different EQ on my channel than everybody else in the band. So I've taken this technology and brought it to the concert hall. I've been turning all my uh, rocker friends into it or finally around my age going, I surrender. I uh -huh. want to talk to my kids. I want to talk on the phone. I want to talk, listen to the TV without scaring everybody in the house how loud it is. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, this is a really great high tech thing. And even if I can do this, if I can make this work, anybody can. I'm lucky to turn the phone on, okay? I'm that guy, you know, child of the 60s. I know that This you... is really user-friendly. This is the best thing I've ever had. This is the best invention, man. I mean, the best, best money I've ever spent. So, Steve, I know that you've been talking to Eva about this whole AI and the A-B testing, and you played around with it just a, a little bit. What are your initial thoughts? Uh, my initial thoughts are, um, I'm just getting into it. I just got this app. And I'm playing with it, and it's really user friendly. And uh, being able to like be in another situation, say I have it set for mine the way I live now. You know, whether I'm out in public, whether I'm rehearsing or, or doing a session or something like that. Pretty much, that's the universal setting. Hmm. You know, and then if I if I'm in a crowded room or I or I need a little more amplification, I need to hear a little louder. I have another thing, and this is all the programmable stuff that we have right here. And uh, that's this part. Mm. And I've been finding that, like, you know, like, say, and it's really great for people, right? The Sound Sense Learn. This is a new, you press new program, and it, right here it says, what is your current activity? Now, for the me, I understand engineer talk. Like, if you say 8,000 kilohertz to me, I know what that means. The average person may not know what that is, but they certainly do know what, what's your activity. Dining, entertainment, family gathering, outdoor, party, quiet, shopping, socializing, watching TV, etc. Yeah. And you could hit on that, and it comes with a pre-programmed um, EQ for that 
considering after your doctors figured out your hearing, this will, you can also change it manually, even by frequency by frequency, if you wish to mess around with it. And you can also go back to where you were very easily. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's the problem with me. I start messing with this stuff. I'll say, for instance, I'm going to say I'm watching TV because I'm talking to a computer right now, right? Yeah. So I'm going, <laughs> wow, okay, well, let's see where this is at. And I hit next, and it says sound profile A active, right? You got yep. this? Yeah. It just has two big buttons for like an idiot like me. All right, so I'm listening to A. I'm going, okay, that's cool. I hit B and I go, oh, wow, that frequency has turned up where my voice would be, where your voice would be. So that would help me in communication with you and I. Yeah. And so I would say it says neither is better, but it also has this right here in the middle, which you can go A to B or mix. I'm going to go B is much better and hit next. It says steps one completed. That's how <laughs> easy it is. I will leave you guys to, to play more around with, with these things uh, for, for the next uh, segment. Uh, and we'll check in with you guys a little bit later. Hi. Speaking of, of AI, we are now joined by one of the smart guys who are behind the AR engine in, in, in Widex. Uh, he's sitting over with Oliver in, in the lounge. And now you can also see that you are more than welcome to pop in more questions. And we will answer those questions later in the show. Over to you, Oliver. Thank you, Klaus. And we're back in the lounge area again, where I'm joined by another special guest. Here with me today is Jens, who is our head of artificial intelligence. Uh, welcome to the studio. Thanks, Oliver. I just want to kick off with a pretty broad question. AI, what is it? How do you define it? Yeah, so that's a, that's a hard question <laughs> to, to answer, I think. And probably there will be a lot of different people out there that, uh, that has better answer that, that, than I has have and probably also uh, has have another definition that, that, than the one that I'm sort of at least thinking of when I th think of what AI, AI is. Um, so to me, AI started as not a, should we say, solution, but more like a sort of problem statement, so to speak, if maybe even a philosophical one for engineers, uh, so, I mean, decades ago, sort of asking themselves, couldn't it be cool if we could build something that can do the same as humans can do? Sort of maybe in a really sort of small contained task that could be playing simple games or, or just uh, a robot walking. I don't know, um, s simple stuff. Um, and uh, and the way to to deem if, if 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 we sort of made AI would be to say, can a human then tell the difference? If is this task solved by a human? Or is it actually a, 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 a machine behind the curtain actually doing this? It could also be chat robots or something like that. Um, then I think all the way up to now, um, we have then for the past couple of decades, we have had this, this tool in our, in our toolbox called machine learning and, 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 and data-driven tools, um, which can quite extraordinarily start to sort of see patterns in, in, in data. So data being a proxy for experience, right? That, that, that you can give examples in some task, <coughs> sorry, um, and then this, 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 this mathematical model can then start to actually learn from that and, and start to use that to, to take actions and, uh, and decide on things. Um, and this is where we are now. And if you go back to the problem statements, we also now start to see that maybe we have actually gone a little bit, or maybe not, or even a little bit, maybe actually quite far from the original, should we say, statement of, what if we cannot tell the difference? What if a human cannot tell the difference? Because today, you might have situations where the AI system actually solves the task better than the human. So a human behind the curtain would be able to tell the difference because the machine has actually sort of been better in some really limited tasks uh, on this specific problem. So not even coming to the same level as a human intelligence, but even going further than that? At least further if the machine and the human go hand in hand. Okay. So I, I think. To me, we have sort of gone a little bit away from the original, should we say, sort of really, I'm an I'm a engineering geek, so I'm allowed to say this, sort of really geeky task of saying, couldn't it be cool if we could do this? Now we're actually sort of really looking at, at problems where we, where, where we actually make a difference, where we make a difference by using AI together with the human to make a better life for somebody. That could be, in, in, in our case, in healthcare, there's also sort of attempts of curing cancer or doing surgery where we, where, where we sort of, where AI and, and human together improves what we can actually do. Um, 
and I, this is this is really cool. So so to me that is the fun area. I'm not sure I would have sort of bought into the to, to the AI field 50 years ago uh, because then it was just something cool. I really want to make a difference for people. So not just a computer playing chess anymore, but a computer beating humans at chess and, and going even further to solve problems that we couldn't even maybe understand, like uh, curing cancer. Exactly. So I think when, when AI kicked off many decades ago, I don't think the, the very first problems was not the ones we are seeing solved today. That was sort of playing chess and just even being able to be the human in playing chess. Um, now we're seeing AI doing things that humans uh, cannot do as good on its own. But right. together with AI and the human in the loop, we actually start to have some, some solutions that are better, performing better than what humans can do alone. So the, the partnering of artificial intelligence and, and humans is, is where we're going now. And, and was this some of the inspiration for you to bring AI into hearing aids, or did you have some other reasons for getting into AI? I think I had more than one reason at least to get into AI. I think when we started off um, in, in, uh, in Widex with, with uh, artificial intelligence, we started out by having sort of recognized that there are just some areas of hearing which, where we're sort of lacking um, care. Um, so for instance, um, being out there with the, with the end user in the end user's real life is really, really hard for a human. I mean, for a, a dispense, uh, HCP. It's really, really hard for an HTTP. Yeah. Um, so what if we could build something that could actually extend, should we say, the care that the HTTP could, 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 could provide to the end user? That was, I think, what, what inspired us at least to, to, to even start with this. Um, Sounds and slurring that we are uh, okay. having today. So this, uh, the need for, for providing some help for users in the moment, in, in real life, where the, the professional couldn't be there all the time, was your inspiration for, for bringing AI into hearing? Uh, so, so I think to me, I think it started even earlier. Okay. Um, I think I was, uh, I've always been brought up with music in my life and with uh, sound in general in my life. Um, I come out of a family of uh, where, where there was always music. There was always music was just not just something you had in the background. Music was something you you listened to. Um, I played myself when I was younger. Uh, my dad had played, um, and um, and then when I sort of all the way back to uh, elementary school, um, I've always been good at math, and that's sort of my should we say area of really where I sort of special. Um, and I think my math. Uh, teacher back in elementary school, he, he sometimes brought us to the music room, so where, where we sort of played instruments. And I think some parents sort of asked, why are you doing that? And, and I think his answer to that was always that, that well, music and math play really good together. Um, somehow they, 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 they complement each other really well. So I've always, that, that was when my interest for sort of music started out. So I've always been sort of playing music while also really sort of uh, pushing the limits for what uh, math, math, uh, math can do. Um, so it was quite um, easy for me when I had to pick sort of my way of being an engineer that that has to be deal with sound because sound is really fundamental to me. Um, I'm enjoying sound. Just thinking about not having sound in my life would, would mean a lot to me. Um, so in that sense, I think um, that, uh, I think that without being really consciously thinking about it, I think looking back, that's probably where the, the reason why I somehow went into that area um, and just pushing whatever I could do with math while s sort of being s um, doing something with hearing and, 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 and sound in general. It's great to hear you have a, a passion that brings this all together. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you ended up developing? How did AI come to life? Yeah, so, so it started in, in, I think, 2010, when I actually had to do my master's, uh, being an elect electronical engineer with a focus on acoustics and signal processing and all these uh, areas of expertise that we, uh, that we are doing in, 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 in the hearing and aid industry. Um, and then 
I sort of was maybe lacking a little bit of more challenging, should we say, mathematical-ish uh, task within acoustics. So I started going sort of into machine learning. Um, and then uh, when I had to do my master's, I, me and Whitex, we sort of said, well, that's an interesting area that is somehow starting to grow, and, and let's start to look at that. Um, so it started all the way back there, uh, back, back, back then, and then I did my PhD within uh, machine learning, which is now called more or less uh, AI, where we started to develop the first, should we say, theoretical foundation for what we have in, 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 uh, in Samsung's Learn. So when I, when I was sort of finishing my PhD, um, I think both I and, 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 and Wydex thought that this was a really interesting area to look into. So f from that point on, we really started to sort of striving to actually making this possible. Uh, okay. Because I think there's been previous attempts to do something similar, but now we had a, so we say, a, a, a technology that could maybe do the job. So Jens, what was the problem you were trying to solve? So the problem we were trying to solve was the fact that the audiologist cannot be there with the end user all the time. Uh, there are, I mean, the end users should be living their lives. They should think about, um, um, they should think about sort of experience all the great sounds that is around them. Um, but there are times where, where things are not just completely right. And instead of having to go all that, all, through all that hurdle of remembering what type of sound was it that was wrong and, um, and, and, and what situation was I in, book an appointment with uh, HTP, uh, HCP, um, trying to explain the problem that I have with sounds. I can do that because I'm normally, I mean, I'm working with sounds, but yeah, sure. normal injuries is really hard to actually describe sounds. It's even so hard to describe sound for me. Um, and then the audiologist have to sort of uh, figure out what to do with the sound and so forth and so forth. So right. Right, what, what if we could make this, should we say, extension to the uh, HTP's care by providing something that maybe could fix that problem or that specific issue that the end user had in that moment really quick. And then going on, just experience sort of being satisfied with whatever sound there is right now and then going on. Okay. Um, that is a hard problem to tackle um, and you have to sort of make a system where the, there's a system learning what the end user want and sort of going back and forth. So in my view that is really sort of interesting that now we have sort of bridged that human computer type of system where they together um, help in this case the, the, the end user out with something that until now, had to be sort of brought to the clinic. And, okay. um, so SoundSense Learn is learning by asking questions what the user wants in a sound and provides them with a sound that they can, they can use in, in the moment when they didn't think it w was quite right. I mean, that that's, sounds like what you were saying, AI and, and human beings coming together. Yeah, exactly. That was, that was at least the, what we tried and also think what we have built. We have built something at least capable of of, of, of learning uh, what the end user want in that moment. And all these programs being created by people with AI must be really cool to see. Yeah, so, so I think uh, sometimes I have to pinch my arm a little bit. Okay. Uh, because I think um, the, me and Samsung's Learn go way back. Um, so for me, it's sort of maybe my first child. I have two sort of real humans at home. Um, but I think maybe this is probably the first child that you had to nurture and you have to sort of sort of actually being able to, to, um, to do great things in the real world. Um, and seeing how much data we actually get from Samsung's Learn, being a, um, um, a testament of people actually using it and, and, and enjoying it, it's, 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 it's quite extraordinary. So, so, so yeah, so, so we get a lot of data from, from real end users. Um, we do it completely anonym, uh, anonymously. So, so, so we, we, we don't want to sort of know who is doing what. But what's interesting is sort of learning what is, what is it that people want in the real world in different okay. situations. So to be able to take another leap in sort of the understanding of, of, of what is it people need to have in the moment in the real life um, to really enjoy wonderful sound around you. 
Well, when we, we've looked at the data before together, I mean, it looks like the, the people have preferences all over the place. And I mean, how do you see anything in that data? That's a good question. So, so I think some would argue when looking at the data that, that well, people are just doing random stuff. Um, so that is also a question you should ask yourself uh, in my position when you sort of are machine learning uh, or, or AI, AI, AI um, scientist that, um, that what if it, I mean, how do we prove that this works? Um, so what we did was um, that we tried to, to, to not only look at the top of the iceberg, because what we're seeing here is only the, 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 the final um, uh, uh, setting of the program that the end user trained in the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, also end users did a lot of different uh, preferences along the way. And bringing all that together from end users across the world and, and, and actually having a model that will only learn something from this data if there is a pattern. That was okay. what we tried to do. Okay. Um, and when we did that, we could actually find some really, really interesting patterns where we could start to see that, well, apparently there are some, should we say, clusters or, 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 or patterns in the settings that people want for specific different environments. Okay, so you're not just looking at the final program created, but the journeys that people took all of the A-B comparisons that they made, so reviewing all sounds and this huge data pool of, of real reviews, then you can start to see some, some uh, clusters. Yeah, exactly. So I think along the way it was, was it, it's, and it's quite extraordinary because I think uh, this is sort of a data set that we would always have liked to have, sort of just having a lot of, of, of preference data from all the users around the world. Okay. Um, the reason why we have that is that we have actually providing them with a tool where they want to spend the time doing these A-B comparisons to find that sort of final setting in the moment. Right. But now we are starting to using this data as a, so should we say, a preference uh, data set where we can start to see what is it then actually that people want. And what we're seeing here is, is for instance, for one tag um, that end user can pick, where they're in a dining situation. Right. Um, and when we uh, train this model to discover what are the different, should we say, presets across users because it's not, this is not showing that, that all end users, for instance, want the blue one. This is showing that, that there's a tendency that, that, that a lot of users will have a setting in the blue area uh, when they're in a dining situation. But there are other end users that doesn't agree with that but want to have, let's say, the, the, the purple area, uh, which is a smaller fraction of end users, yeah. but they still should be represented. They shouldn't be sort of neglected. Okay. Um, and this is different, uh, different, I think, from what we have been able to do for the past yeah. many years, where we, have, we haven't been able to do something um, sort of fundamentally different than, than, than what the majority of people want. Okay. Uh, want. Here we have a, a system that can really sort of dig into what is it that the, that the individual uh, people actually want. So in that dining situation, you could <coughs> say that there would be a, a high probability that some users will like the, the blue preference cluster and some users will like the, the green preference cluster. Yeah. So you can- At least to begin with. You can make some smart predictions when people are in these areas where they may like um, the settings to be. Yeah. Uh, and that seems really cool and exciting. I mean, what, what could you, I mean, what can we do with this, these insights? Yeah, so, so I think first of all, um, we could start to explore if, if these presets, uh, I don't know, I don't have a better word for it, but, but these clusters, um, if they would be good enough for some, right? Okay. We, we can see that some end users, and a lot of end users might just want some of these presets. Okay, so try these out first, for example. Exactly, okay. and then try to take it from there because I think there's also there's probably also a process of of how much how much time do you want to spend yes. in training your precise sort of uh, setting in that moment, um, countered towards sort of how much how much better do you need it to, uh, do you want it to be? So I, I think bringing these insights back to the end users, uh, to me is is fundamental because in, 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 at the end of the day, this is, we want to improve the end user's life. Uh, and we don't want them to spend a lot of time uh, spending time if we already know what the result would be to begin with. And this is, uh, this is what sort of takes one step in that direction at least, that, that now we can maybe sort of jump the fence, so right. to speak.
it almost feels like it's going full circle. We have AI helping users to find perfect programs in the moment, and then you use some more AI to analyze that. And then so thousands of people with the help of AI can help people all around the world. I mean, it's, it seems like this perfect partnership between uh, human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Exactly. You can see this is, this is sort of, this is teamwork on steroids, maybe. I That's mean, a lot of people helping each other out, finding sort of suggestions for other people. Uh, and I think this is some of the things that AI gives you if you do it right. That's really exciting. AI is uh, pretty cool. And I actually have quite a few questions from, uh, from the audience that has been ticking in. Um, the first question is, you know, how do you see AI in relation to the HCPs going forward? So, so I think from the HCP, you can really see AI sort of extending their capabilities, extending what, they can, what services they can provide uh, for their clients, um, mm. being there more or less always uh, in their pocket or, I mean, or elsewhere. So really helping them out uh, all the time. That's, mm. that's, to me, the big difference, I think, what AI can do. Mm. Okay, thank you. And I also picked a question for, for you, Eva. Uh, and remote care? Well, that's a very good question, Klaus, and thank you very much for that one. Well, as you can see and have seen over the uh, past uh, hour here, me and Steve, we have been through um, the uh, fine-tuning, the programs, how to use the Soundsense Learn here in Compass GPS, but there's also possibility to do the feedback test and sensogram, so there's actually no limitations whatsoever with the Widex Remote Care. I'm glad you're saying that. That's what I thought as well. <laughs> uh, maybe we have time for one last question for you. Uh, um, then this is, uh, when it comes to client and end users, what are the future possibilities with AI, do you think? So, so I think from the end user perspective, I think it can, AI has, can sort of simplify things for them. It can, it, they will, end up seeing things as being simpler, but actually more capable. Mm. At least that's, that's what I hope we are actually able to achieve. Mm. Thank you very much for that answer. And also thank you for the past uh, 20 minutes or so uh, with, uh, with your engagement here and all the insights that you have brought to, uh, to the show. Thank you so much for participating. And thank you also, Oliver, for, for doing that. No problem. And I will now join Steve and Eva to see what they have been up to for the past 20 minutes. Steve, you've been trying the, uh, the new programs for a little while here. So what, what do you think about it? I was really just happy that it was easy to use because a lot of times uh, people overachieve by adding too many options and making it more complicated. Anything that requires me to pick up a manual and my ADHD kicks in, I'm like, hello, the first paragraph. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's no help yeah. for me at all. This is user friendly and it's very self-explanatory. And, and thank you for making a design for uh, any intellect, you know? Yeah, it's good to have a few options, right? So you have the equalizer, but you also have the possibility to oh, work yeah, with that's what I'm saying. I can, I personally can go in here and go, I'm a little light at 5K or something like that, because I know what that frequency is. Also having, as you would say, tinnitus, yeah. which is, uh, the, which I found out is it reason where why you, Get that tone, your brain makes that tone. That's the exact frequency of the deficit that you've heard. Yeah. So by using the wide X, it's actually improved my tinnitus by not making my brain so hard. So for that alone, it was worth the price of admission. So this is a uh, this is a great accidental thing. I don't know if it was built in by the engineers, but they certain certainly helped me. And I heard about this from Jeff Beck back in 1997. So the the, pr the promise of this is getting better and better has truly shown up in this little box, you know, and now that it's in everybody's phone, that's my girlfriend, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to meet her too. Well, it's, it's yeah. good to hear about that. It's good to hear about that it's helping you with the tinnitus also. So, oh, thank this, is you. A, this is a win win. You can't mm -hmm. lose. I'm telling you. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Any final uh, 
comment? Uh, well, so I, I'm just going to add that it's a possibility after a few weeks for the HTTP to see what's going on in the log window here, also mm. in Compass mm. GPS. It's very easy to follow the changes. So, Steve, <laughs> um, just here on, on the last uh, 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 bit here, I, I, yeah, are you to, working you on new material? When can we be that. enriched by your, by your music? Yeah, actually, I am. Uh, me, both myself and Joseph Williams from Toto have solo records coming out February 21st on Mascot Records. And uh, we're going to be touring as Toto, uh, assuming that we're being able to uh, leave the country yeah. and things cool out uh, next summer. Yeah. And uh, I've spent the last year learning a lot about myself and really getting to know my kids and my family and sleep in my own bed and be in love and yeah. do the self-improvement. Thankfully, I'm uh, been very God is gracious uh, being able to do that. But also learning about what's really going on with people that are uh, on not so fortunate, you know, and trying to do our best. And maybe this will bring us all together as people. Maybe we learn from the isolation that we miss people and right. we should be nicer to each other. No, That's I'm a non-political statement, okay? Yeah. That's but on, on that happy note, I really, really want to thank you very much, uh, Steve, for your participation. It has been a great pleasure and a lot of fun and a great honor to have you with us. Thanks. I hope that we will be able to see you on tour uh, uh, soon. Yep. Uh, thank you, Eva, best. also for, uh, for taking us through this uh, remote uh, fitting. But this is not the only thing that Widex can do for you. So to tell us a little bit more about what Widex can bring to you, we have invited brand leader for Widex, Vipke Massen, to join the show. So, Vipke, welcome. You are the global head of the Widex brand. What do you think of the show so far? Well, I think it's been a really great event, right? Yeah. I mean, we had fantastic speakers, mm -hmm. uh, and it was super interesting to follow Steve during his fitting. Yeah. You know, in these moments, I really feel proud and honored to lead a brand that is able to deliver this kind of sound experience to people that are hearing impaired. Oh, I agree so much. And you're relatively new to the company, uh, that's, that's no secret, but what was your first impressions of, of the Widex brand? You know, it was my first imp impression and it almost gets confirmed every day. The level of expertise in the Widex brand is simply astonishing. Mm. You know, um, people are so skilled, they're so passionate and they're, om they're united in this goal of developing and delivering sound excellence. Yeah. I mean, it started way back in 1956, but it has never changed. It's yeah. still the same, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, it's a true heritage branch if you look at it. I agree. So where do you see the future for the brand? Well, let's be clear. Um, our ambition for the Widex brand is sky high. Mm. So we just released the Widex Moment. Yep. Uh, it's a premium product with a true premium benefit, which is pure sound. Mm -hmm. And our ambition is to make pure sound available to a much broader audience, mm -hmm. simply because we believe that everyone deserves this level of sound quality. Yeah. Can you re reveal a little bit more on, on that? Yeah, definitely. And you mean in terms of premium? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, let me reference the latest brand tracker, which is a study that is mm -hmm. conducted amongst customers. So Widex is recognized for three main attributes, trust, support, expertise. Yeah. So really great values, Absolutely. I believe. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do is to build on, on these values that, has been, that have been built over decades. Mm. Uh, and we will create an ecosystem around the product that is delivering on this notion mm. of premium. Mm. Um, so um, I, I believe you have someone with us. Uh, that, uh, that can also elaborate a little on this? Yes. So I brought someone with me who is, first of all, he's a great ambassador of the brand. He knows his customers. And he's also a great colleague. So here is Robert Wallace. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here at a global event. It's such a privilege. Um, you know, I'm very new to, to the Widex team, but I've got to confess, I've always been a secret admirer of the Widex brand, the Widex customer, and the Widex experience. 
I've been in the industry for 28 years and I've worked in all continents and I've been exposed um, to all uh, customers. And the one thing that's always resonated is the consistency and the passion for the Widex brand all around the world and the passion of the Widex patient to continue on with that brand. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Can you give us some, some concrete examples of your, from your experience? Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I think I've got a really good example from a, a few years ago. I was facilitating a consumer focus group in our industry, and we had about 10 end users in this group, all wearing different brands, all wearing different styles. And as I was running this group, there was this consistency from this one patient in the room, this one wear in the room, where he was just vibrating with confidence and vibrating with, you know, uh, accolades around our industry and the technology that he was wearing. So at one point, um, when there was discussions going on in the room, and you know, people were kind of complaining about sort of the, the normal stuff around acclimatizing to hearing aids and everything, he pulled his hearing aids off and he said, these hearing aids are great. They sound so natural. I wear them everywhere. And this is my third set of hearing aids from the same brand. And I tried others and I couldn't wear them for more than a day. And as I was looking at these hearing aids, I realized that they were Widex. And, and this advocacy, this passion behind how he was being helped in his everyday life and how natural sound was so meaningful to him, it really changed me. It's really not about bells and whistles. It's really about that foundational natural sound and that that's what creates loyalty. That's what creates a tribe and that that's what really makes the patient journey so much better. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting because when I joined the company, I, very, I heard it very often this, once Widex, always Widex. Yeah. So there's certainly a sense of loyalty and passion and also commitment to, to the Widex sound. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and certainly I love that now. And, and I think it's something that, uh, you know, we all appreciate with Widex. And it really comes down from the commitment of our founders. When the industry began, this commitment has been there from Widex. And it's never wavered in terms of having this thirst and this quest for that perfect sound. Regardless of what platform we were working on at the time or what was available to us in technology, it was always a part of our passion. It was always a part of our why. And I think that's just such a strong aspect of the team and everything that I feel with the team that, that I have the privilege of working with day in, day out, and the teams that I've been exposed to all around the world. And that loyalty to that objective and to that mission is really all based on that patient loyalty. It's what keeps us going. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. But there might be different needs from clinic to clinic. So how, how do you make sure to support the individuals? It's, it's, it's a really good question. You know, an individual really starts with the individuals that work for WIDEX. And it's those individuals interacting in everything that we do every day in the simple things in the simple interactions and in the complex interactions and those individuals having the empowerment to do what's right not every situation is the same and i think you have to have individuals that can do what they need to do to support our customers to support that patient journey and really understand how they make an impact on that and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of everything that we do every day. There is no magic formula where you can just put it on a, on a, on a chalkboard and say E equals MC squared. This is about sort of a customized formula for every interaction. Everyone in the organization or all levels of the organization participate, whether it's through our operations, whether it's through our audiology, our salespeople, our executive team. And I look forward to being a part of it in the future once we can get back to a, a, a normal. I mean, Widex is really recognized as a trusted brand yes. in all recent studies. Why is that so? And why is it so important? Well, trust is our main currency. Right. It's it's really what 
allows us to have a relationship and it's what guides us. Voice of customer is super important and voice of customer needs to guide everything that we do. And hearing people is how we create trust. And it's essential to how we support and how we continue to reinforce trust and earn it every day. You don't earn trust once. Trust is challenged. Trust is, uh, uh, you know, taken uh, for granted in terms of supporting that relationship between the patient and our customer. So without trust, we really don't have a business. We really don't have the ability to create value. So it's a big uh, part of what we do. And in the end, we're in a communications business. So we have to find how we make and, and manufacture trust as well as our, our products. And I just grabbed that, what you mentioned before, that the widest values of trust and support and expertise. How will, how will you continue that journey? Individualization in terms of every fitting. And if you look at the way our fitting protocols work, it's ingrained in the way we do things. It's ingrained in our, in our workflows within our fitting software and the reasons why we do certain things in terms of guarding that natural sound. Our research is all based on individualization and consumer behavior and what they like and what they don't like. And a real big expression of this in terms of this new uh, sort of foundation of technology, it's really not about sort of chips and stuff like that in terms of what used to drive our business. It's really about that sort of artificial intelligence. It's about intelligence. I, I really don't like the word artificial in front of it because it's about designing that intelligence into our interactions on an everyday basis through our apps so that these, these instruments that are worn by our, our patients that we all love and support can create individualization. And through that individualization, they can truly make their hearing aid their hearing aid, if you know what I mean. And that's what really creates natural because natural is a perception that is different for everyone. As we know, everyone has a different hearing loss. So really being able to pull off that claim that, uh, you know, that is continuously uh, so annoying to our competitions in terms of changing a Widex user is what makes us so strong, but it's by design in everything that we do and supporting that natural sound through our interactions and through our patient engagement through what we do today and how we use our technology. Oh, thank you so much for a great interview. I think you're really living the, the brand, no doubt about it. So I really want to thank you, Vipke, for being here in the studio with me. And thank you very much for being with us online. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. It's been an absolute privilege. I, I enjoy it, and I hope you enjoy our, our entire event. Thank you. huge thank you to all of our studio guests today. And also a huge thank you to all the viewers at home. We hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we have here in the studio and that you have gotten something out of it. Thank you all very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.